Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our virtual professional development week four Wednesday workshop on mentoring up. My name is Dr. Jane Indorf, and I am the manager of undergraduate and graduate programs with the Leadership Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's session is all about mentoring with a focus on how to be a mentee. We will learn what mentoring up actually means and get advice on navigating mentoring relationships, which can sometimes be a bit tricky. We have three incredible panelists joining us today who are all experts in mentoring. I'd like to introduce today's moderator and also panelist, Dr. Will Whittles, who is the Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs at Brown University's Graduate School. In this role, he collaborates with and builds capacity for Brown's PhD programs to maintain and raise the standard of excellence in research, teaching, and mentoring for which graduate education at Brown is known. Dr. Whittles has a PhD in political science from Duke University. He previously worked with the Leadership Alliance as manager of programs, and he still works very closely with the Alliance. In fact, he was a huge contributor to the development of this summer's virtual professional development program. Thank you so much, Dr. Whittles. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Dr. Indorf. Um, I have the very great pleasure of introducing uh, my two fellow panelists. Um, first, I would like to introduce Dr. Delia Shelton, who joined the Department of Biology in the at the University of Miami, Miami as assistant professor in January of 2022. She holds degrees from uh, Southwestern University, Prairie View a and University, uh, Indiana University, uh, and Indiana University. Dr. Shelton has secured funding from the NIH, NSF, and the United Negro College Fund. Her lab has three active lines of research, understanding development and evolution of social behavior, identifying the mechanisms that lead to environmental contaminants, such as metals and cadmium, um, which induce behavioral disorders, and developing co commercializable tools to enhance thin fish aquaculture. Dr. Shelton's research program is enriched and accelerated by the diversity of her students, colleagues, and other stakeholders. She has mentored 52 individuals from diverse backgrounds, including PhD students, master's students, undergraduates, and high school students in full-time summer research programs or multi-week academic year internships. Dr. Shelton has published 15 peer-reviewed articles with her mentees and was featured in a short film with a mentee about the impact of the NSF Animal Behavior, Behavior REU program. I'm also joined by Dr. Marcus Lambert, who is the Associate Vice President of Research Strategy and Operations at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. In this role, Dr. Lambert oversees efforts to expand the university's extramural research portfolio in areas of health equity and clinical research. Dr. Lambert also co-leads multiple research training programs at Downstate, including Transport, a $10 million endowment grant with a focus on recruiting and training underrepresented scientists in health disparities research. Dr. Lambert received his PhD in biomedical science from the NYU Grossman School of Medicine and his Bachelor's of Science from Howard University. He also holds, holds an MS in clinical epidemiology and health services research from Weill Cornell Graduate School. Welcome both uh, Dr. Lambert and Dr. Shelton. Um, we have, uh, I think, a, a very important uh, conversation to, to have with you all today. Um, I think we're going to dive right in with um, the, the defining mentorship, some of its concepts. And so I have the very great pleasure of handing the floor over uh, initially to Dr. Lambert. Dr. Lambert, please take it away. Thanks, Dean Whittles. You know, I, I wanted to set the stage by just talking about what is mentorship. Oftentimes, we have sort of different definitions or different sort of concepts and about what mentorship really is. So just to get us all on the same page, we define mentorship largely as the National Academies might define it, uh, which is a professional working alliance, which individuals work together. So this is different from like your classroom professor or a teacher who sometimes speaks at you or there's just this sort of sometimes one way one way relationship uh, a mentorship relationship is is predicated on people two people working together so these individuals work together over time to support both personal and professional growth 
Um, and the key aspects about this that uh, I certainly, and I think my panelists would agree, are important is the fact that this relationship has both aspects of career advancement and psychosocial support. So that's things like, okay, well, maybe I want to be, you know, scientific researcher once I finish, you know, undergraduate. And that's the professional or career aspect. But there are also psychosocial pieces that you might go to mentors for as well. Like, how do I navigate spaces where I don't feel like I belong or, you know, these other sort of what we call psychosocial aspects? So we define mentorship, but why the need for mentorship? Uh, I think we might all agree, and you can go ahead and, and yeah, put up all of the bullets just so everyone sees. Um, we might agree that mentorship is important for navigating your education, your training, your career. There are certain parts of, for example, you know, going through school where uh, it's not so defined. You know, I think certain aspects of college is, is pretty straightforward. You take your classes, there's a curriculum, you know, you can maybe pick your schedule, which is flexible. But when you get to aspects like gaining research experience and working in a laboratory, that's not such a defined sort of curriculum, not all of the time, right? So that's where aspects of mentorship may come into place. Or you might have aspects where, you know, you need a little guidance on the career that you might want to choose or, you know, the, the psychosocial pieces that I mentioned. So mentorship is important for those aspects. A another sort of piece that I want to point out of why mentorship is so critical is really this knowledge triangle. If you see at the top of the triangle, there's this green portion of what we call unconscious competence. And if you might sort of you break those things, uh, you know, apart, unconscious, meaning like you're not aware of it, but, you know, you're competent in that you sort of know that these are things that you kind of need to know, right? These are areas where you, you know, need improvement, but you don't you don't have the knowledge yet. Whereas conscious competence is like, oh, yeah, I know that. Right. Um, how many of you have like taken organic chemistry or, you know, some hard subject? Right. Like you you kind of know that you're going to need to know that, but you don't know the knowledge yet. But once you get down to the bottom parts of the of this triangle, like an orange or red, that's where mentorship really can play a valuable role. Conscious incompetence is like, OK, well, maybe I've gotten accepted to a Ph.D. program in graduate school. I don't know what to expect, but I know that I'm going to need to know some things about scientific research and, you know, maybe aspects of molecular biology or something. Right. Or engineering. You know that you're going to need to know these things, but you don't know them yet. And so mentorship can be important. And then unconscious competence is just things you didn't even know you needed to know. You know, I didn't know that I needed to know aspects about this particular thing in order to be successful in this other thing. So that's where mentorship can be surprisingly important. And the other thing that we really want to come across is that uh, consider having one mentor. So think about your mentoring needs. Oftentimes we think about one mentor fulfilling all of those mentoring needs. If you're any person like me, you know, like I need mentoring in, you know, leadership. I need mentoring in specific aspects of the research that I'm interested in. I need mentorship, you know, even sometimes peer mentorship in other respects. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to find one person who can fulfill all of those needs. But when you have multiple resources, multiple people, multiple sponsors, multiple coaches, multiple peers who can help address those needs, it provides a more uh, surefire way of making sure that your needs get met. So we want to help you think about not only having, uh, when you think about mentorship, having, you know, one person who can help, but actual multiple people. And the next slide kind of goes into what some of the roles that those multiple people can play, uh, whether it's traditional mentor or a sponsor, someone who really advocates for you, who might write that letter of recommendation or says your name in the room when you're not in the room. Um, a coach, you know, someone who, you know, might help you navigate a particular situation, uh, other, other peers and people like, like connectors like myself, you know, I may not be the expert in, you know, certain aspects of physics, but I can connect you to someone who can, right? And identity mentors, sometimes you need people who just understand, you know, the way in which you identify. Uh, and there are many other roles that might not be listed here. But I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shelton to talk more about this mentorship network or constellation of mentors. Yes, I wanted to wish everyone a happy Eid because I, I know that's uh, 
that's happening today. And I also um, wanted to recognize, uh, also build on what uh, Vice President Lambert talked about. And I understand that you all have a post-workshop activity, so I'll place this into context. Um, in this, uh, we developed this uh, mentoring network, or as um, Dean Widows has suggested, is this, this mentoring mosaic, um, where you have all these other needs, right? You are the center of this mentoring network, and how can you be successful, right? Do you, um, and those needs might be, you need assistance in setting goals, planning, skill development, emotional support, role models, accountability, work-life balance, collaboration, access to resources and other opportunities, and many, many other needs, right? Asking one single person to meet those needs is a lot of pressure, right? On that individual person and might not leverage their best expertise, right? So your PI or your primary investigator or your um your lab director might feel that need in allowing you to um, build uh, build knowledge related to that skill, right? But say if you want to pursue a career outside of academia, right? You want to go into industry, you want to go to nonprofit. That academic mentor has spent their whole life in one area. They are not going to know um, those other aspects, but you can use them as maybe as a connector or a sponsor to help um, uh, where they will leverage their network to help you um, achieve that type of success. So I would encourage everybody to um, download this um, this mentoring network and on, on your own, fill it out um, so that you can you can be more successful, right? And identify those, those people in your life or if you don't have them, right? That tells you where there's that gap in your mentoring network and maybe start to focus on those to kind of identify people um, that can help fulfill that need. I can go ahead and turn it on to turn it over to Dean Whittles. I'm on mute. You would think after this many years of Zoom, <laughs> I would remember, but no. Um, so now that we've gone broad, we want to go a little bit specific and talk about mentoring up, so to speak. I like to think of it as proactive mentoring um, in the context of a research mentorship relationship while you are an undergraduate. Um, so this is sort of specific to your situation, um, but definitely take away this key point about you don't want just one mentor because they, they can't perform all of the roles that you will need. Um, they can't mentor you in all the ways you want. And I think that often we run into some kind of dissatisfaction because we're hoping for some kind of support from a given mentor when that's not really in their wheelhouse. And we're worried that if we start working with somebody else, that will somehow be perceived negatively and nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, but to, to come back to this specific, very central relationship of your relationship with your research mentor while you are an undergraduate. We wanna think about proactive engagement. So you as the mentee are not passive in this relationship. Um, you need to be proactive in providing the your mentor with the necessary information so that they can do, so they can help you, so they can be a partner in your growth. So um, uh, 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 Lee et al. defines mentoring up as proactive engagement in the mentor-mentee relationship so that both parties mutually benefit from the relationship and move forward towards agreed upon purpose and vision. So there's a couple of things that we want to highlight here. So one, it's a mutualistic relationship. A mentor should grow as a result of working with you. Uh, that's one of the joys of mentorship, frankly, for most mentors. It's an opportunity for them to grow and learn. The best mentors are involved in these relationships because they have this great opportunity to grow. Um, the second thing I want to highlight here is that um, it's agreed upon purpose and vision. So often we leave the goals and the purpose of the mentorship relationship implicit. 
you know, uh, you start working in somebody's lab and then you start calling them your PI and it sort of takes on this tacit assumption that they'll write letters of recommendation for you and guide you on your way to graduate school. And frequently that's the case. But frequently it is also the case that they may not have the capacity for one or more of those uh, modes of support. And in that event, if you're expecting that support to be available, but they don't have the resources for it, that can provide that kind of tension and difficulty that sometimes crops up. So being explicit about the agreed upon purpose and vision is quite important, especially at this undergraduate level, precisely because as Dr. Lambert was saying, when you're starting your research journey, there are so many competencies that you're not yet aware of that you might need. Um, you're really developing that sense of yourself, of who you are as a researcher, of what kind of research tasks you really like to take on, and what kind of research tasks really aren't your strengths. And we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Research is a team exercise, and no person can play every position on any given team. If your skills are in running the ball, you need to be running the ball. If your skills are in throwing the ball, you need to be throwing the ball. Um, all of these things can be coached and can be taught, but you're gonna be better and enjoy certain aspects of the research project process more than others. So what does this mean for you as an undergraduate researcher working with a, a senior scholar or even a graduate student or a postdoc? The first thing you want to prioritize is really maintaining effective communication with the person you're working with. So taking the opportunity, if your mentor hasn't been, to be explicit about how frequently you'll meet. So asking the question, what kind of meeting cadence do you think we should start out, try out during our time together? Um, how often do you think I should be meeting with you or, and, and even providing your mentor with some sense of what the kind of thing that works best for you, right? Maybe they're more frequent, but shorter check-ins. Maybe they're distanced more apart, but you have a longer time to work. Um, there is no right answer. And I think frequently, particularly when you're starting out on your journey, you're saying, well, just tell me what the best way to go is. And um, they may give you a suggestion, but it really needs to be rooted in your working style, your learning style, which may change over time. So maintaining communication about that, you know, we've tried meeting, you know, uh, 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 far apart and having longer meetings. I, I think it might, maybe could we try meeting more frequently, but a shorter check-in or checking in over email in between our larger meetings. So that's number one, maintaining effective communication around these questions of how and when do we share information about how we're doing. Um, the second piece is aligning expectations. So what is it that we're working on together? If you want somebody to be a career mentor more than a research mentor, being explicit about that. Say, you know, you've been working at um, Johnson & Johnson as a chemist for, you know, a decade. I'd love to hear about working in industry. I'd love for you to help mentor me about what that journey would look like. That way this person knows, okay, what this wonderful young scholar is coming to me for is they want to get a sense of my experience working in industry. They may have some questions that they'll ask my viewpoint on. I, in turn, will get an opportunity to hear about this person's young, this person's developing uh, a, a career, and that's a learning opportunity for me. So aligning those expectations, because you could have somebody who wants to be a career coach for you, but it could be somebody you're working on their research project, in which case the expectations are going to be different. Right. The expectations in that case is you won't necessarily get to work on a related topic that you're maybe a little bit more passionate about in this particular case. But you will have the opportunity to understand how research works, acquire core skills and be able to point to something that you accomplished when you do go on to pursue that other question. The last piece, and I think this is perhaps the most important for the stage that many of you are in right now, which is say being an undergraduate researcher. This is assessing, understanding, 
of what is going on, of, of what the relationship is, is going to be like, and also making sure that you're on the same page at all times. So for example, here's a very concrete expectation. You, you meet with your advisor, with your, your research mentor, and they say, okay, by next week, I want you to accomplish X, Y, and Z. Some mentors will say, after they explain that, okay, can you tell me what I told you? Just to make sure that we're on the same page. I would take it a step further and actually just any time they give you a set of advice or, or instructions or there's some sort of deliverable to say, okay, what I've heard is we want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. Do I have that? Did I miss any details? Making sure that you got what they were saying and then also that they get what you're saying um, is absolutely important. Um, this way, uh, because you haven't been working together, it's a new relationship. Um, it, taking those moments to check in and assess each other's understanding of those expectations of those goals will be absolutely vital to getting you both off on the right foot. Um, so that's just a little bit. Um, I think the most important thing, though, of course, is for us to get to the opportunity for, you know, Q&A, right? This is, you know, uh, mentoring relationships or a dialogic relationship. So I think I'm going to kick it off with one question, um, uh, and I'm going to pose it to my fellow panelists um, uh, and take a couple minutes to respond to this. But what advice would you give to mentees so that they can make the most use of their time, uh, most use of their mentors' time, skills, knowledge, and resources? What advice would you give to mentees so they can make the, the, the most use of their mentors' time? Uh, skills, knowledge, and resources? Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to start. Um, I, 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 I was <laughs> going to be careful with my choice of words here. I was going to say, I love to mentor, but I, you know, I don't want to be inundated with uh, requests. I'm happy to, to mentor. But a key part of like meeting with me, for example, is coming like with an agenda. For example, like if we set like 30 minutes, I usually set like very short meetings and then we can have more in the future. But like, if if we have 30 minutes together, like make sure there are very good 30 minutes, like come with questions, come with like a set sort of things about what you want to discuss. And it can be an open conversation, but you want to be prepared. And, you know, and, and part of being prepared is, is either having an agenda, you know, either for yourself or sometimes if this is a long term, you know, mentoring relationship and you're coming to present data to your principal investigator, you know, uh, have a set, you know, agenda about what you wanted to talk about so that you maximize that person's time and they will appreciate it and they'll be happy to meet with you even more, even more when you sort of have that very proactive, you know, um, approach to, to the to the meeting time. Yeah, I'd like to second that. Um, so one of the ways that I help train my lab is that they have an agenda and uh, sending it to me before gives me that time to, um, you know, think about it, right? There's, y'all ask a lot of great questions, right? So, and sometimes it's hard to think on the spot to like give you the best solution, right? Or the best idea or best connection, right? So I think like even sending that agenda before and maybe identify and remind your mentor, right? Like we have lots of things that are going on. So even providing a summary of the meeting from the last time, um, uh, would be super helpful than going on to saying, hey, these are my bottlenecks. These are the challenges. Um, and this is what I plan to accomplish next time. Right. So one, you recap the past, you say what you're doing now, and then you tell us what's going to happen in the in the future. Right. So that gives us like a little piece of like, OK, this relationship is going to continue. Right. And so I, I think I think being prepared and and yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> That's just to follow up on that. You can even, I mean, at, this may have been what Dr. Shelton was saying. So, so um, if I'm repeating what, what you're saying, Dr. Shelton, I, I apologize, but you can even structure your agenda in that manner, right? The first part of it can be a recap. Like if it's an ongoing relationship, let's say it is with your PA. Here's what I accomplished over the last week. Here's where those challenges are. And then let's set our agenda for next week. Here's what I think so the next step should be what what would you what would you recommend um if you're working with somebody on preparing an application to graduate school 
that's a really great way to approach it. Okay, last time we talked, you know, I, I, you know, I hadn't generated my list of schools yet. Here's my list. Um, and, and, you know, what I want to start working on next is maybe evaluating some of the, some of the potential mentors that could be at that school. And then for the next time we meet, I will have worked on my statement of purpose. Um, and we can maybe go over that. So that's where I think um, the, the work that you're, you two are doing together is very clear. I think sometimes it can be, particularly from the mentee's perspective, necessarily unclear what, what needs to be going on that agenda. And I think that in those cases, you may be feeling stuck between different options, right? Um, you could be stuck between wanting to pursue a more competitive opportunity, but you're afraid you're not going to get it. Maybe a less competitive one, but it's not quite as well, you know, matched to your to your your preferences. Being upfront about that, being upfront about where you are stuck in your own decision making. So not just where you're stuck on a problem that you've been tasked with, but where you're stuck in your own decision making, what your doubts actually are, um, what your concerns actually are. I think that maybe this was just me when I was an undergrad. I was often afraid to share those things with my mentors for fear of judgment. And when they don't have that information, um, they can't actually help you resolve the questions that you have. And if, if a, a mentor is actually going to judge you for having those concerns, they are not, in fact, a mentor. Um, that is not a relationship that will provide you effective mentorship because a mentor knows that it's a, a, a mutualistic relationship where you're both moving forward. So um, being honest about those questions, being honest about those tensions is one way to very much maximize your time with your mentor. I believe we had a question just pop up in the chat. Ah, what is the best way, in your opinion, to approach someone about potential mentorship who you've never met in person? Uh, well, I can also try to tackle that one. Uh, sometimes if you have, you know, it depends on the context. If you have someone who, who does know that person and knows you, you know, maybe an introduction, you know, could be appropriate. You're, sometimes you're you're more likely to get a, you know, a response or at least, you know, a validation that, you know, you are curious and you're motivated and you're worth the time and investment if someone you know is able to connect you to that person. Um, but other times, you know, you may not have that connection. And, uh, you know, if you uh, really just sometimes write a compelling story about, you know, why you want to be connected with that person or why you would like to meet, um, they'll, they'll, you know, take the chance on you. And uh, maybe they won't, but if they don't, maybe that's not the, the mentorship, you know, for you, but, but don't give up on just one email, you know, wait sometimes a few days or a week and, and follow up because we're all really busy. Sometimes we miss emails. Sometimes we, you know, we're well-intended but ultimately, if they don't respond, then maybe that wasn't the right mentorship relationship for you. So uh, don't be discouraged and keep pushing forward. Yes, I, I can add that. I would say absolutely a warm introduction, <laughs> meeting somebody sponsoring you and connecting you and say, hey, this is so and so. Um, could they have a five minutes of your time, right? So I think that that's the other really important thing is that you have to understand that these people are, are probably busy, right? And you want to be like, ah, oh, maybe not a whole hour, right? But just like, hey, just five minutes. Can I get my foot in the door just to make an impression, right? And then you might say, oh, okay, you might decide that, well, that five minutes was enough. This person is not a good connection. This is not how I thought this was. Or whoa, this was amazing. So the next time, hey, I do need, maybe I'll work my way up to that 30 minutes or an hour, right? And so I think you can get a lot of that assessed through that just short amount of time through there, right? Um, th through those initial connections. And then I think there's the other aspect of being persistent, right? So a lot of times people are like, oh, or e even I, I, I even do this, like, Oh, I emailed them once and I didn't hear any back anything back from them. Like that can be feel really discouraging, right? Like you're like, geez, they just didn't even like recognize, they didn't even acknowledge my email, right? But you have to imagine that um 
this person, right, is maybe getting thousands or hundreds of emails a day, right? Um, I know that's really hard to imagine, but but it does. Or they all come at the same time. So it's not that they didn't want to respond to your email. It's not that um, they like are ignoring it. They just might have missed it, right? So I think um, like uh, maybe thinking of like some benevolence of like, okay, I can try again. It's not really, it's not, it's not any of these negative things. I just need to do it again, right? And usually a rule of thumb is like three times, right? Um, but sometimes even more, right? If you're like, I really want to make this connection, keep following through, right? Like keep, don't give up on that, right? Or even like if it's really important, right? You're like that mentor is not responding. <laughs> Phone call or show up in their office. <laughs> I don't know if you watched Hidden Figures, they just showed up, right? So I think that can be a, a good way to kind of a, approach that, right? Yeah. I mean, I think an additional question, if you've never met this person, how do you really know you want them to be a mentor for you, right? Mentoring is a relational um, activity. Uh, somebody might have a phenomenal research reputation or even a great reputation as a mentor, but if you've never interacted with them, you can't actually know that you want them to be a mentor. Um, so having the opportunity to create that interaction is what you want to be looking for if you've never met the person before, so that you can then decide if you want to move forward. I think Dr. Shelton really persuasively just touched on that. One way to do it, um, in particular, if, if it's somebody who's in a career path that you want to pursue, is to talk, is to use the phrase informational interview. So let's say you're you're thinking about, you know, summer research projects. There are maybe some labs that you can apply for. Um, you say, can I take, you know, take 15 minutes of your time to just do an informational interview to find out a little bit more about what kinds of things your lab is working on, what kinds of projects you have going, um, what kinds of, you know, mentoring opportunities there tend to be in your lab. It could also be, for example, a graduate student. Let's say you're considering applying to a particular graduate program. You can look on the list of graduate students and see who's working in an area that you're interested in and send them an email and say, hey, do you have 15 minutes for an informational interview about what it's like to be a PhD student in this program? And you have that conversation and maybe you get some good information, maybe you don't, but if there's a good vibe, if you feel like you're, you know, this could be um, a relationship that could be ongoing, you could after that and say, hey, listen, I really appreciate our conversation. Would you mind in a couple of months when I sort of start working on some of my applications or, or thinking about some of my schools, if I could pick your brain about some of those questions? Now you've been explicit about asking this person to sort of be a bit of a mentor for you in the context of applying to graduate school. So it's taking it in those stages um, rather than sort of just creating a big relationship and then expecting it to fall in place. Like you wouldn't send an email to say to somebody who you've never met before and say, hey, do you want to marry me? Right. I mean, um, because you're setting up a relationship. Um, and so you want to find out if there's a good match there for the purposes of that relationship. Next uh, question. OK, uh, this is a very great forward looking question. Um, because mentoring relationships are, they're also time limited. They're for a specific purpose. Um, so the question is, how do you maintain a good mentor-mentee relationship after summer research experiences end and after graduation? I can, I can do this um, because um, there, there's some mentors that are like lifelong mentors. So my, my grad advisor, I've known her for over half my life, <laughs> more than half my life. I, I met her through a um, through an NSF, National Science Foundation Research Experience for Undergraduate. Um, and um, I, I I think I'll, I'll just drop her hints of good news, right? It might just be like, hey, this is what's going on in my life right now. And uh, they might wish me well, or um, sometimes um, I think we mentors always like to hear good news, right? Updating them on that piece of advice that you, you have, uh, that they provided, um, sending them, th people love thank you notes, right? Comments, courtesies of like, thank you so much for that interaction, right? That gives them a nice positive thought um, to think, okay, they got something out of this. Um, another, um, so, so yeah, I think making that that connection, feel free to share those positive times. And then if you need more like challenging times, it's 
if you have that type of relationship, please, I, I think you should consult them about that, right? But you shouldn't just have the mentor where you're just constantly asking them about challenges, right? Like negative things that are going on. I think you need to pepper them with some sweet things along the way too, right? Yeah, it was well said. You know, I was thinking, you know, uh, one of the big things I love mentors for is navigating sort of, you know, transition stages or transition points, you know, which of these graduate schools should I choose to go to, you know, and reaching out to mentors to get their input. But, you know, you doesn't you don't always want to sort of be the one to sort of suck information and knowledge and advice, you know, have things to sort of give or positive things or updates or, you know, even just other ways to just stay connected. Maybe you found, you know, there was a new publication that came out that's relevant to them and, and say, hey, I thought of you. And, you know, when I saw this this publication, and it's just a, a way to check in and, and keep the relationship going, especially if you feel that it's valuable. This comment, I would say that is the best way to give a compliment to a, someone in academia is like this publication made me think of you. <laughs> like it's like, oh, <laughs> so that's that. Yeah, that's another great way. I appreciate that. Vice President Lambert. Remember, most of the time your mentors are just getting criticism from their peers. Um, they're they're when they get positive things from their mentee, that it's very sustaining. Even if they've got a gruff exterior, um, those things really do touch people. Um, and that's a really wonderful way to keep your mentoring relationship going. Um, so we now have a prickly question, a, a trickier question. So how do I approach a mentorship relationship that I feel isn't benefiting me? For example, if the mentor was chosen for me through a program, or even if it was my choice, but it isn't what I expected midway through, um, particularly in the case of, say, a research mentor. Yeah, th those are a bit challenging. And, you know, sometimes you, you have to approach it case by case. But, you know, let's say you're in a summer program and, you know, you've been given a mentor who, who uh, is, you know, your mentor for that defined period. Uh, it, it, it really depends on, you know, certainly if, if there are lines that are sort of being crossed where, you know, that relationship this happens, it can be, you know, abusive or toxic in a particular way. You know, you certainly tell someone of authority, you know, about those scenarios. And there are times I've been a summer program director. There are times where I've moved individuals out of laboratories and switched them during the summer. You know, this was usually in like the first week or so, you know, the red flags were like almost immediate. And so that that can happen. You know, that's why you have people who are there to support you. But, you know, the the other piece of it is that, you know, it is a short time period. So you you may not, uh, you know, you kind of stick it out and you realize what you can get from that person and what you can offer to the laboratory. Um, but there are other times where, you know, you may be a graduate student and this is a long term investment. And, you know, maybe you, you chose a mentor that is just as they reveal themselves, you realize that this is not a healthy relationship or is not the relationship that I expected, you know? And uh, so there are certain tactics where you can, you know, incorporate to help improve that relationship. You know, certain the things that, uh, you know, Dean Whittles talked about, about, you know, communication, effective communication, aligning expectations in the beginning about, you know, what's expected of me and what I expect of my mentor. And then, you know, also recognizing that, you know, sometimes you will need multiple mentors to help with other aspects. So, you know, maybe your mentor is not great at, you know, editing your papers or something. You can rely on your thesis committee to help or something, you know, figure out other ways in which to advance yourself, but you have to be proactive. Um, so those are my initial comments. Yeah, I, I think that was um, captivated a lot of my thoughts. And um, I would just emphasize um, leveraging this mentoring network, right? Like if you're, if you have this one bad apple, right? Like, is there a way that you can minimize their influence on you, on your success? Right. And I think it's also, um, can you cultivate other relationships during that summer, right? Maybe you have a really great relationship with the other graduate students or the students in your program, um, or even another advisor, right? Um, one of the things that I usually, uh, when I was in this REU program is that I told them you should go meet five to 10 new people every week, right? So that's how you start to kind of plant those seeds um, to kind of 
um, maybe expand this mentoring network. Yeah, as um, so sometimes there's these tenuous situations where hopefully there's, you can rely on these other support systems like the program director, another PI or uh, other folks um, in your network. But yeah, I think that's really like the strength of having this mentoring network. Yeah, to, to echo what uh, my colleagues have, uh, have been saying, when uh, it's a question of the relationship being sort of destructive or, or negative, then, you know, you do want to, to to find other people to, you can lean on and maybe potentially change that relationship. When it's a case where not all of the needs, which are legitimate, your needs are legitimate, are being met, maybe you need to add somebody. And maybe you even have a conversation with your research mentor about that. So it could be, for example, that you're working on a project, but it doesn't match your current research interests. But there are some core skills that you can develop, and that part of it's going well. You can say to your mentor, hey, listen, I'm really fascinated about question X. Can you recommend anybody who I could talk to to learn more about it, or, 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 or maybe who can give me some papers that I can start exploring this question on the side? I really appreciate what we're learning in terms of these techniques. It's been great growing in that. And I want to add this to, to my growth experience this summer. Um, or it could be vice versa. It could be that you're working on a really interesting question. It's a really interesting topic, but they're not in a good position to teach you some of those core skills. You can say, hey, listen, I really want to find some extra support around learning how to do a Western blot or how to, you know, run this kind of regression or how to do this kind of ethnography. Are there any resources that you recommend? Um, this is a great question to direct at some of your near peer mentors who are in that process of learning those core skills. Maybe they've just been exposed to that and you can approach them about getting that legitimate need met. Um, but in all cases, this is being clear about what your needs are, what growth opportunities you wanna pursue, and then having a positive and constructive conversation with, the, with your mentor to say, how do we meet that without, you know, overburdening you as my mentor. Um, so, so yeah, are... and and well, if I could just add to that really quickly, sometimes you know, especially when you're in these this sort of short summer program opportunities, you know, you get you you have a preference about the lab or the type of science that you want to do, but maybe you don't get matched with that. You know, it, it might you might get matched with your second or third choice, or or maybe not even in the top three. But, you know, that's where it's good to have mentors and, and people that you can reach out to and say, hey, you know, I, I was really interested in this topic. Uh, you know, are there resources where I can get connected to just meet with some people or, you know, sometimes th that, you know, may not necessarily be available, but still being open to the experience that you're having because you never know like how valuable those skills are that you might be gaining. Like you may be learning something that, you know, you wasn't initially interested in, but it might be valuable for you when you get to graduate school, because who knows, you know, especially the interdisciplinary nature of things, right? So being open to, you know, sort of all those experiences and, and having this sort of positive attitude and, and trusting in, you know, your mentor's advice and, and the placements and all of that, you know, it, it uh, there there's can be benefit from surprising places. Speaking of surprising places, my next question is, can there be advantages to a mentor who does not have much experience in your field of interest? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it depends on, you know, what, uh, how you kind of, I guess, see getting, ben getting benefit from that person, you know? the field of interest that you're that you're interested, you know, that you're working in, but that mentor can help you with just understanding how to, you know, write, you know, a manuscript or something or other aspects that will help you develop as a as a person or as a as a scholar. Um, so just thinking again about um, what you can the benefits that you can derive from many different types of people. Yeah, I, I'd second that. I, I think different mentors have different approaches and different individuals have different ideas about what they want to get out of a research experience. But I think sciences or, or academia or PhD or these summer research uh, internships are thinking you how to think like a scientist, right? Um, you might not necessarily, you might be after this research experience, oh no, this is not for me. This helped me. It, I was in a fork in the road and this absolutely helped me determine that I know I don't want to do that, but let me go ahead and try this other area. Like I went right, but 
no, I should have gone left, right? And you still have opportunities to do that. And so I think like you could use that experience of like, man, I, I gained, I've adjusted my, um, what I want to get out of this experience. Maybe it's that um, I, I'm going to learn how to write. I'm going to learn how to think like these people in this lab, right? In this discipline. And then you can leverage that for your next internship or next research experience, right? Um, I think there there's a lot of um, self-discovery, right? So I think uh, Dean Whittle said, okay, you need to identify where the problem is before you, um, or have some thought about like, okay, this is what I'm thinking about, right? Before you approach this, approach your mentor. I think that might help you with some of this internal self-reflection that can get you to your next phase or, uh, or career path that's better aligned with your, with your new found desires or so. So this is a, this isn't quite a mentorship question, but it's related. And honestly, uh, you two are so interesting that I really want to hear the answer to this question. Um, what's the most meaningful research experience you've ever had? And to connect it to mentorship, how did the mentor play a role? I was, I was trying to think about this because, um, you know, okay, hopefully, hopefully there aren't any Merck representatives on here, but mm -hmm. so, so I, I did a, um, I did an internship at the, um, through, um, at Merck. So it's through the United Negro College Fund Merck, um, initiative. And, um, I mean, the facilities were beautiful. They were state of the art, um, fan, fantastic. Right. Um, but I was in this, um, pharma, this like, uh, very fast paced pharmaceutical environment. And I had all these tools, right? Um, but I, I knew after that, I knew then I did not want to go into industry, right? So I think that was incredibly valuable because, um, well, the pay was wonderful, but <laughs> the type of environment and the type of, um, it, it really made me um, self reflect and realize, well, I needed this. Um, I needed to have more autonomy in terms of the research questions that I'm doing and uh, so that the work is more meaningful to me rather than I'm meeting someone's bottom line to get this drug out so that they can improve, improve their profit margins, right? So um, um, still, I learned that Wow, I really want some of those state of the art tools, though. So when I have my own lab, right, I know what to what what um, an institution can do. So, um, yeah, and many years later, so that's been almost ten years. Um, I have students that wanted in, to go into industry, and I still maintain that network, right, so that I can then connect them with the other people in my network that want to go into industry, right? So I um, I think that was really valuable and that they were incredibly supportive of the career path that I, I chose, but also um, could also, I guess, support f my future endeavors as well. My most meaningful um, research experience uh, was an opportunity to study tuberculosis in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And uh, that was funded through my undergraduate institution at the time, Howard University, which was supported by an NIH grant called uh, MERT. It was like the National International Research Training Program or something, but it was a training grant. This opportunity, I spent a summer in Ethiopia studying tuberculosis and, you know, kind of going back to one of those previous questions. Initially, you know, I was hoping to do a little bit more, you know, basic biomedical sort of research. But uh, a, a good chunk of the project was really epidemiologically focused. It was looking at the prevalence of tuberculosis on a, a dairy farm. And uh, that was just an eye-opening experience. I had never really, you know, gave cattle like a TB test, right? But it, it was just an amazing experience. And I ended up, you know, sort of going to the lab and doing ELISA and other, you know, micro, more microbiology, you know, uh, related things. And uh, and it just, again, really opened my eyes to the impact that science could have on people and, you know, largely communities. And I was like, this is amazing. Right. And it just really solidified my decision to go to graduate school rather than medical school, which I was also sort of teetering on at the time. 
And uh, I ended up getting a first author publication from that experience, you know, presented that work in conferences, for example, in Puerto Rico. It just became like such a, you know, fantastic experience. And, you know, you never know about like your journey, right? Like after I finished like my PhD in, in biomedical science, I ended up going back to epidemiology. So that became like a really, you know, a nice little primer introduction to the field. We've, we've suggested a lot of pieces of advice. Um, it's kind of a, not necessarily a lightning round, but if, if our, if, if, if members of the audience, members of our webinar here can take one thing away around mentoring up, mentoring networks, being a proactive mentee, what would it be in your view? I would say, I would say you have to do this exercise of creating this mentoring mosaic, right? You've got to go through, it will require some self-reflection. It will require like you identifying those influential people in your life and also identifying your needs that are met and unmet, right? So I think it, it really follows that kind of agenda that we talked about of say, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. This is the resources that I have, and this is what I don't have. This is what I need, right? So I think you're doing that with yourself, right? You're doing some self-mentoring. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Y'all download that uh, mentor network and, and fill it out. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Shelson, you hit the, the nail on the head. And I was just going to say, similarly, you know, oftentimes we jump to try to think about, okay, well, who, who do I want to be my mentor or, or what mentors do I want? When really the first step is a little bit of self-reflection. You know, what are my goals? What are my needs? What areas do I feel like I'm strong in? What areas do I feel like I'm weak in? What do I want to improve? And then thinking about those things, thinking about what your goals are and what your, what your capacity is to grow, you can think about people who might help to fill those needs uh, or resources or programs. So. Um, I hope that brings some benefit. Um, I, I have to 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 confess that was exactly what I was thinking as well. I was even thinking about the the self mentorship piece, but um, uh, I want to drill down a little bit, really, on this um, goals question, um, a wants question, the things that you're choosing question. Um, those aren't what a mentor should be dictating for you. Um, so it's really vital that you think about that clearly on your own and you can bounce ideas off of people to understand what your different options are like. Um, but really being honest with yourself about what you want to do, where you want to go forward, um, and, and then articulating that to, to your mentors who can help be guides. And, and I think the last piece of that, and this can be the hardest piece, especially at the stage of being an undergraduate, um, or, or rather two pieces of it is one, your wants, your visions, the goals that you really have your eyes on, those are legitimate. Um, if somebody doesn't think that they're not the right goals to be pursuing, then they're not a suitable mentor for you. Uh, somebody else who who does believe in that and believes in you will be a, will be a more effective mentor. The other piece is recognize that your goals and your wants are going to change. Um, I don't know a single scholar who, I mean, maybe there are some out there who are doing exactly what they envisioned they were going to be doing when they were an undergraduate. Um, our, our research interests change all the time. The kind of, uh, uh, the kind of area of research that we like to be in, I'm, and, and this here I'm thinking in terms of what part of the research enterprise you're really good at, um, uh, those things change over time. When Whether you want to be in industry or in academia, those things will change over time. So being open to discovering a new interest or realizing that what you thought you were interested in is not what you're interested in and being willing to adjust your mentor network accordingly will really serve you very, very well. Um, I'm going to turn things uh, back over to Dr. Indorf uh, to wrap things up. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you on, on behalf of well, certainly on my own behalf and on behalf of my colleagues for, for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. Wow. Yes. Thank you so much. That was great advice that I wish I had had back in the day because I see how applicable it is to my, my younger self kind of trying to make my way in the world of academia. So thank you so much.
I would like to invite everyone to join us next week. We're going to have some panels on applying to graduate school. So please join us next Wednesday, same time, same place. And we will hear about that whole process. That can be a little daunting, but this will make it easier. Thank you.